My name is Nicole Gillette. I'm a conservation advocate with Tucson Audubon Society. And um, if you were in my session this morning, you know that for conservation work in this area, Tucson Audubon and myself, we've really been focusing kind of on three key riparian areas. Um, at, if you live here in the desert or have visited, you know that water very much equals life here. And we've been focusing more and more on those riparian areas that we know um, birds and other wildlife really need to thrive here in southeast Arizona. Um, so we mentioned this morning that we, we focus on Santa Cruz River, the San Pedro River, and Sonoida Creek. So today, and we have been for this festival, we're going to focus on Sonoida Creek. And I have two great co-presenters with me today. Really, my role is just going to be to click through all these slides for them. Um, but I'm going to actually let them introduce themselves because I've lost them on the screen, so I'm sure everyone else has as well. So um, when they're um, introducing themselves, feel free to find their video so you know which talking head is presenting at uh, any given moment. So here's just our title slide. So I'm going to ask Keith to unmute himself and just give a little bit of background of who he is and where he's coming from today. So Keith, if you don't mind taking yourself off mute. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Keith Camper. I uh, live in Tucson, a uh, transplant from Michigan, where I grew up and went to college. My educational background is in sociology, so interested in the study of human social behavior, society and culture, and surrounding you know, our everyday life. Uh, a particular interest in uh, social problems, uh, stratification, and social change. Uh, worked for many years in the nonprofits in Michigan before moving to Southeast Arizona in 2003. Uh, interested, maybe obsessed with birds since I was a teen. I can blame my seventh grade science teacher for that. Uh, been fortunate to be able to travel to Central and South America, Southeast Asia, and India, but my favorite place to birds still remains uh, Southeast Arizona. It's a, founding member of Arizona Fuel Ornithologist and served as that organization's first vice president. And I'm on the Arizona Bird Committee. Played quite a few trips to Mexico, ah. as well as Belize and Guatemala. And I uh, guide professionally part-time in Southeast Arizona and enjoy getting out to underbirded locations and weird places like dairy slot ponds to look for shorebirds on the I'm on the board of directors at Tucson Audubon and serve on the conservation committee and the patent project team, uh, which is working on some very exciting improvements to the patent center. Um, volunteered at the patent center for the last few years, filling feeders and along with a lot of other volunteers served as a birding ambassador for the visitors and sneak in quite a bit of good birding time there too. I uh, never thought when I first visited the patent center in the early nineties that one day I'd be standing inside of the house, uh, looking out into the yard. Uh, when I'm not birding, playing with one of three dogs, and numbers often swell with like fosters. And for the last 20 years, uh, I provided care for a lifelong friend who's a quadriplegic. So I can turn this over to Carolyn so she can introduce herself. Thank you. Um, I'm Carolyn Schaefer. I have lived in Patagonia for 21 years now. And given the chaos of the times, there is no other place or any other group of people I want to be with as we transition through these multiple crises. Um, we have every skill set needed to co-create the better world we all know is possible. Uh, my working career was in business management, um, most of that in law firm management, and then I co-owned a power line construction company. And when I moved to Patagonia, worked for a while here at the Montessori School and also started the local artist gallery. Uh, so the organizational skills and strategic planning served me well in working to protect the water and wildlife of this incredible place I call home. And I'm happy to share that information with you today. Uh, I think of a, a quote from um, Alice Walker about activism is the price I pay to live on this planet. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Keith and Carolyn. I love that you guys are wearing shirts today. <laughs> um, and we did have a question what PARA stands for. So uh, Carolyn, do you want to explain a little bit about PARA before we get started? 
Yes, the, the problem with acronyms is you get so used to using them. So thank you, someone, for asking. Patagonia Area Resource Alliance formed in 2011 in response to uh, modern mining showing up in the mountains. And uh, so it is Patagonia Area Resource Alliance, and we say PARA for short. Thank you for asking. Yeah, always make sure to drop those kinds of questions in the chat box because acronyms are another language. So keep them coming. All right, we're going to move forward here. This is just quickly what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to start off with a larger view of the Sky Islands and where Snorita Creek fits in all of that. We're then going to go on a little virtual bird walk. We're then going to take a deep dive into what the mining in this area looks like um, and what those mining impacts might be having on our birds and conservation work. So please do keep those questions coming in the chat box and we'll have time again um, at the end for Q and A. So without ado, I'm gonna go on mute and I'll see you guys on the other side. We've well, seen this year's uh, festival is focused on the Snowda Creek watershed. It's birds, the habitat, restoration, um, also the threats and the conservation efforts to protect this is one of the most biodiverse areas in the United States. As we look at this uh, eBird map here, we can see how many birding hotspots there are along Sonoyta Creek and in the Patagonia area, mountains to the south. There's well over 300 species of birds that have been found in this area. Patagonia has also been considered the pollinator capital of the United States with reportedly 600 species of native bees, 300 types of butterflies and moths, 14 species of hummingbirds, and two species of nectar feeding bats. We could go to the next slide. Patagonia is located about 60 miles south of Tucson and about 19 miles northeast of Nogales, which is on the US-Mexico border. Um, here we see the Santa Rita Mountains to the north of Snowda Creek and the Patagonia Mountains to the south. Both those mountain ranges and the very lush Patagonia Sonoida Creek Preserve, as well as the Sonoida Creek State Natural Area and the Patagonia Lake are all individually designated as important bird areas. Uh, important bird areas you know, have a number of criteria which could include supporting birds of conservation concern like being threatened or endangered, uh, having large concentration of birds. You could also have birds associated with very unique or exceptional habitat. Um, we can see, if you look through Sonoida Creek here, just how extensive that riparian habitat is, going from Patagonia all the way out to the Sonoida Creek State you know, Natural uh, Preserve. We can go to the next slide. Some of you are probably in the presentation on the Cuckoo Corridor, so this will be a little bit of a review, but we can see on this, uh, here that there's a confluence of several major eco-regions. You can see the Sky Islands are mountains, basically look, can be looked at as like forest islands between a sea of desert and uh, grass. Here we can see the Sonoran Desert coming in from the west and the terminus of the Rocky Mountains coming down from the south. Chihuahuan Desert coming in here from the east and the Sierra Madres pushing up from the south. Uh, the Patagonia Mountains have a distinct Madrean character. Then on the next slide, we can see that the biotic community is the Sky Islands change as we begin to climb. So we also have the vertical you know, gradient. Around Tucson, where I live, we're kind of down in the desert scrub. Things start transitioning a little over 3,000 feet to, fourth, you know, to desert grassland. Patagonia, we're surrounded by oaks and you know, grassland. We move up above 5,000 feet, we have oak woodland. One of the unique things about the Patagonia Mountains is the extensiveness of the oak woodlands. Most sky islands, that's just a narrow band before it transitions up above 6,000 feet to the pine oak woodland, and then above that to pine forests, all the way up to 9,000 feet where we get the mixed conifers. We can move on to the next slide. We can see Patagonia up near the top left. 
there. So it's about three miles from the town of Patagonia is where we're going to start at Harshaw Creek Road. It's about four miles from the Patton Center. You can see the spirit tree in there is right near the beginning of that road. We'll move on to the next, uh, next slide here. Harshaw Creek's about 15 miles long, a mostly ephemeral stream that when flowing goes north to northwest into the town of Patagonia where it joins the creek. It's uh, named after David um, Harshaw, who settled here in the 1870s. The four mile long stretch of Harshaw Creek ranges in elevation from about 4,200 to 4,500 feet and provides some of the best creek birding. Go on to the next slide. So over 175, um, excuse me, over 175 species have been found here just along the four mile road. 430 checklists submitted to eBird compared to over 11,700 checklists for the Patent Center. This includes a number of species reaching their northernmost edge of the range, as well as rarities like the yellow green vireo. We can pop onto the next slide too, which shows the, the eBird stuff. Four hundred and thirty checklists seems like quite a bit, but it's uh, when you compare that to the patent center with over eleven thousand lists, I think that we would probably be able to find a lot more species if we had a lot more birders going going out there to check out this habitat. We can move on to the next slide. Here we have the elf owl, it's the smallest owl in the world, and perhaps the most abundant raptor in the upland deserts of Arizona. It's often associated with saguaros and desert vegetation. Uh, it also inhabits subtropical thorn woodland and riparian forest like we see here. We could play the call of this common owl and We could move on to the next species. This is the West whiskered screech owl. You can see here, because it's close up, that it has bristles on the end of the facial feathers, giving it its whiskered name. It coexists with up to 15 cavity nesting species, including other owls, woodpeckers, and trogons. Eats insects, and during monsoon, it goes after June bugs. This species has a very limited range within Southeast Arizona. Here's an example of one of their calls. It's kind of a neat area along the creek where we uh, have one of those areas where both whiskered screech owl and western screech owl um, overlap. You can see, you know, just how well this bird can be camouflaged here. It's a bouncing ball. It's bouncing ball call is commonly heard here at night. Let's uh, see if we can hear a sample of that. You can also hear in that recording the common poor will calling there. Kind of a neat species along there. Sometimes you can get, you know, the two screech owls calling alpha owl, great horn, and common poor will. Um, common poor will is related to the Mexican whippoorwill, which nests in the Patagonia Mountains and will split from the eastern whippoorwill and has a very limited range just coming into the United States and southeast Arizona and into New Mexico. So here we kind of begin our daytime, you know, daytime bird walk right here at the Harshaw Creek Road. We can go on to the next slide here. You can see this massive, massive cottonwood here. It's uh, quite impressive, you know, indeed here, and contains a lot of birds. Let's move on to the, the next one.
Thick-billed kingbird is one of 19 species of flycatchers that actually uh, have been recorded here along the creek. Um, this is one of the best areas to see this bird in the United States. Well, last time that I visited here, I've had about five different, uh, different territories of this. These birds are found in a really rare habitat for southeast Arizona, which is here along the creek with both uh, sycamores and for cottonwoods. Here's an example of a common vocalization we hear from this pretty noisy species. This next flycatcher that we have here also breeds. It's the northern beardless tranulate. Um, this bird lacks the rictal bristles, uh, which are present on other flycatchers at the base of the bill. Um, they're lacking, so that's where it gets the name beardless. This uh, little guy builds really extravagant, you know, large nests, you know, with side entrance. And like the, the previous species, has a very limited range coming into the U.S. only in southeast Arizona, southwest New Mexico, and southern Texas. Here's an example of their very distinctive vocalization. This next flycatcher is one of the last spring arrivals in southeast Arizona. Typically inhabits uh, select canyons and mountains where you have tall sycamores and other trees growing along streams. It's also in lower areas like this in sycamores and cottonwoods along stream. Um, it's a bird with a very limited range just reaching southeast Arizona, southwestern New Mexico. So it's a, one of those Arizona specialties. We can move on to the next one. Here's the Lucy's warbler. A Lucy's warbler nest uh, in uh, close association with riparian mesquites. Uh, it nests in concealed you know, cavities and similar sites, including next boxes as uh, Tucson Audubon Society citizen science research has uh, clearly documented. They experimented with a lot of different styles of next box and apparently the open triangles were the ones that were preferred most by Lucy's warblers. Uh, additional research on the nest box height and the use of native versus non-native mesquites also, you know, been conducted. Go on to the next bird. Uh, this is a neat area right here. Uh, this rocky area is to the right of, uh, of the road. We, on the left, we have the the creek, and over here we have rocky area that not only adds to the, the beauty of the area, it, uh, it, also, it also adds different species. The next species that we see is one of the birds that's tied most closely to rocky areas like that. Nests in little crevices and uh, definitely, uh, definitely tied to those areas. We move on to the next bird. Here we can see a uh, bit of a pull off here. It's definitely a great, uh, great area to, uh, to be able to get off to the side. See if we can go to one of the next slides. There we go, Mexican jay. Uh, Mexican jay is a very socially -like complex species. It's uh, found in oak zones, um, permanent terries, territories of five to 25. Uh, with each, within each territory, one to four, you know, females will breed si simultaneously and young are fed not only by parents, but also by other flock members. Here we can hear a common vocalization of this uh, Mexican mountain species. Acorn woodpecker is another very socially complex species. Lives in family groups of up to a dozen or more. And uh, birds in social groups, they uh, communally gather acorns and uh, are able to stock those for times when they need them. Very conspicuous, entertaining, has a crazy white eye, 
and uh, rarely stays quiet for long. On the other end of the detection spectrum, we have the Montezuma quail. Often the first uh, found is a flush straight up from your feet, which is pretty invigorating. Um, they fly up to 100 meters after that, usually dropping into the grass where they're invisible once again. Uh, trained dogs do a lot better job than trained birders finding this, uh, this elusive species. Um, getting lucky and seeing one crossing the, bird, you know, crossing the road like this bird is really, a, really quite a sight and I get excited every time I see that. Sometimes when they're out in the open and they're noticed, they freeze and from a distance can appear like you know, a rock. So keep an eye out on roads as you're driving, you know, driving along areas like this you know, and you know, check out all those rocks. It could, could be a hunkered down Montezuma quail. Uh, they're most vocal during the monsoon season and their descending song is quite distinctive. Hooded Oriole breeds in the southwestern United States, Mexico, and all the way down into Belize. This bird adds just a really nice splash of color, you know, along Harshaw Creek Road. Listen for its little rink rink call as you go along. Almost sounds like a smaller, uh, less uh, vocal version of like Mexican, Mexican jays. The next species is the yellow-billed cuckoo. This is part of the Western distinct population segment. It's not a different species or different subspecies, but it's very distinct from the Eastern population and it's threatened under the Endangered uh, Species Act. Um, factors leading to that decline include habitat loss and alteration. It's been a very robust data collection and conservation efforts to uh, protect this species. Um, this can be a pretty common vocalization in the summertime along Harshaw Creek Road. We move to the next slide. This is a this is a fantastic area here. It's especially good. Um, it's about a mile from the beginning beginning of the road. You can see Harshaw Creek crossing, you know, crossing the road there. Um, you get a nice mix of mid elevation you know, canyon birds like hepatic tanagers and Arizona woodpeckers, along with some of the lower riparian birds like summer tanagers, yellow-billed cuckoos, and blue grouse beaks. There's tree tobacco in this area, it's native to uh, South America. It's often attractive to, to hummingbirds. We move forward to the next slide. This is a relative newcomer to the United States. It's a violet-crowned hummingbird reaches the northern part of its range in southeast Arizona and southwest New Mexico. Nest almost exclusively in Arizona sycamore trees, which we do have along this stretch here. So it's quite important to be able to keep areas like this, you know, in good shape. This is the bird that put Wally and Marion Patton's home on the birding map. It's now the Tucson Audubon Society Patton Center for Hummingbirds. The hepatic tanager is a bird that breeds mostly in like open pine and pine oak area. Uh, this is about the lowest elevation that one might find, uh, find them breeding. So though the hepatic tanager is considered, you know, one species right now, uh, there's been a lot of research recently that suggests that there's probably three species, you know, involved. Go to the next slide. The Arizona woodpecker is absolutely handsome and it just makes it, you know, up here into the United States and Arizona and Southwest New Mexico. It's the only brown backed woodpecker that we have here in Arizona. So if you see one with a brown back, it's definitely Arizona. This section is fantastic. You can look down from the road about 30 feet and see the creek down below it. There's perennial flow here, and uh, this vantage point allows us to see the mid-story in the canopy a lot better than we normally would. 
So it's absolutely a great place to bird. There's a pull off just before you get there and it's really good. The road descends to the creek crossing just, uh, just beyond that. This next uh, species is absolutely fantastic. And it's the bird that sparked my desire to visit Arizona when I was a kid. It has a very limited range in the United States, um, nests in old banded woodpecker holes. Um, every year they do an elegant trogan survey of the Southeast Arizona Sky Islands. They've recorded seven pairs, including 11 males, one unknown, or a total of 26 in the Patagonia Mountains. We can see the routes that they, they use to survey here in the Patagonia Mountains in the next uh, slide. If you look here on the right side, you can see the Harshaw Creek Road. That's where one is recorded. But looking at the city of Patagonia, right up here, how close multiple elegant trogons are. It's absolutely unbelievable. You can go to the next, uh, next slide. This is a very bunting, absolutely gorgeous bird, very limited range. It's bumping into the United States. It eats insects, um, you know, cactus weeds and other things. Um, breeding is very dependent upon rain here in uh, Arizona. And oftentimes if there isn't enough rain, it'll delay its breeding until, uh, until August. Kind of eggs are polymorphic, which is among, you know, in color amongst uh, some populations, which is a rare phenomenon pastoring birds. This next species is uh, the northern pygmy owl. This first little guy is up during the day, preys on rodents, and as we can see in the slide, also lizards. The mountain subspecies may actually be a uh, separate species. It has two double whistled notes versus the true pygmy owl that has just a single note. Golden eagles are sometimes seen soaring over Harshaw Creek Road and over the Patagonian Mountains. Um, they're a habitat generalist. So they range from the Arctic all the way down to the desert. They can take down some pretty big prey, but generally go after rabbits, hares, and ground squirrels. Here we have the gray hawk. Has very limited range and highly sought off after birders once again. Um, preferred prey is lizards. Its distinctive call often alerts birders to its presence. So water sports the entire ecosystem here that, upon which we all depend. Carolyn's gonna tell us about the potential threats uh, that the extractive industry poses to this area, as well as efforts to monitor and preserve this biodiversity hotspot. I'll leave you with a brief audio file um, I recorded here at Osho Creek of the beautiful and rather rare sound of running water in Southeast Arizona. There's also a spotted toy singing in here in the background. Thank you, Keith, for sharing the beauty of the birds in this important bird area. And gratitudes to the Tucson Audubon for the opportunity to share information about the biologically diverse ecosystem of the Patagonia Mountains, where the threat of 21st century industrialized mining looms large. It is a classic David versus Goliath story with a system of rules and regulations that allow the corporate profit story to be more important than protecting the water and all life forms. There is archeological evidence of more than 10,000 years of human occupation in the Patagonia Mountains with the Sobapari O'odham tribe and the Hohokam tribe being the documented indigenous peoples. Ancient stone tools have been found at mine sites and turquoise from these mountains 
were used in ceremony and for trade. When the Europeans occupied these lands, they began to mine minerals on or close to the surface. This mining is what we call today artisanal mining, very small operations with low impact on the land, the water, and the air. Then in the late 1800s, mining moved to an early corporate model, which was encouraged by the 1872 mining law signed by President Ulysses S. Grant to settle the West. Bulletin, we've got a lot of people. Sadly, this almost 150-year-old law still governs hard rock mining on federal public lands. The next evolution of the mining industry lasted through the 1960s, when the technology available to go deeper for minerals wasn't yet invented, making the operations cost prohibitive. The classic mining story of that era is the company would go bankrupt, leaving environmental disasters for the taxpayers to clean up. Next slide, please. The 21st century business model of industrialized mining is significantly different. During 100 years of mining in the Patagonia Mountains, a total of 250,000 tons of ore was removed. 100 years, 250,000 tons. A former owner of the mining proposals in the Patagonia Mountains stated it planned to remove that 100 year total every 25 days. The current federal administration is weakening environmental regulations. The mining industry identifies the state of Arizona as the ninth friendliest mining jurisdiction in the world. Next slide, please. Beginning in 2006, several foreign mining companies began to develop large scale mine proposals in our bioregion. There is no modern mining that will meet the standards of responsible mining to sufficiently protect the health and vitality of our ecosystem. The active mining companies in this area, immediately outside the town of Patagonia, are outlined in that red area there. And there are two mining companies there. The darker gray areas, the three parcels, are owned by Barksdale Resources, a junior Canadian mining company. And I say owned, I mean they have the claims there. Those are forest public lands. Then the green area and the yellow areas are claims controlled by South 32, an Australian mining company. The total of all the acreage inside that red area is just over 39,000 acres. And while we're looking at this map, I also want to point out the yellow areas in the middle. Those are private patented lands, which is a unique thing under the 1872 mining law. You used to be able to go out and work a mine claim for a little while and then say to the federal government, gee, this is great. I'd like to own it and the federal government would sell it to you for $5 an acre. The patented is still on the books, but has been on hold for about a dozen years now. And the green area up top there with that circle is the Harshaw Creek area where we saw all those birds. And they're right there at the location of concern. Since 2011, PARA has monitored the activities of mining companies in order to ensure the actions of these companies and of government agencies have sustainable long-term benefits for our public lands, our water, our wildlife, and the ecosystem in which we all live. PARA successfully defeated an open pit mine proposal halted exploratory drilling on Forest Service public lands and influenced the state requirement for the remediation project from a $3 million passive water treatment plant to a $25 million active water treatment plant. The other two uh, active mining companies in the area are the Hud Bay, which operates, hopes to operate the Rosemont project 
and also Rio Tinto, which has been filing a lot of claims but has not announced any intentions. Next slide, please. The big elephant in the room at the moment and the most advanced proposals are South 32's Hermosa project. And where you see all the activity on this picture is the patented private lands. They can do a lot of work on these private lands and escape most environmental regulations. In August of 2018, South 32 acquired the Hermosa project from a junior Canadian mining company. The companies have been very careful to stay within the boundaries of that private land. The previous owner of this project had forecast daily production of 10,000 tons of ore, consumption of 650 gallons of water per minute on a 24 seven work schedule and daily traffic of, traffic of over 600 vehicles. South 32's pre-feasibility study will provide information on how it intends to move forward with an operating mine. The company has delayed the report from its original release date last April, then it was going to be September, and it just announced that another delay of the report and it will be due sometime in the last quarter of 2020. Next slide, please. There are hundreds of abandoned mine sites in the Patagonia Mountains and many leak acid mine drainage. The Coronado National Forest Service does not have sufficient resources to remediate all the old sites. PARA is currently monitoring and reporting to the Forest Service a leak at the former World's Fair mine on Flux Canyon Road. The picture you're looking at is not the World's Fair mine. This is a, an older mine leak from about three years ago that the Forest Service has now remediated. The minerals that South 32 wants to mine are deep, about 1,500 feet below ground. The water level is at 100 feet. So the company just announced that it intends to run a massive dewatering program in order to construct decline shafts to the minerals. It is projected that they will draw down 1.6 billion, with a B, 1.6 billion gallons of water per year for a four-year dewatering project. This will reconfigure the watershed. The company is submitting permits to state agencies and PARO will file objections to the plan when the state announces a comment period. Next slide, please. This region is part of a wildlife corridor identified as one of the top 10 areas in the world, most in need of protection for species survival. The proposed reconfiguration of the watershed does not bode well for the health of the mountain or the watershed. Mining operations are exempt from state dark sky laws because it would be an economic hardship for the company. But the wildlife suffers from this level of round the clock industrialized mining. PARA has been monitoring the endangered Mexican spotted owl, which roosts in the Patagonia Mountains. The adults return to this area, but no fledglings have been spotted for several years now since modern mining activities started. Next slide, please. It is no wonder that the Mexican spotted owls have stopped breeding in this location. Next slide, please. Power recognizes that the health and prosperity of this region are tied to the well-being of the Patagonia Mountains 
and the Harshaw Sonoida Creek watershed, which are the source of our drinking water, clean air, biodiversity, and overall wealth of natural resources. Their continued protection helps drive this region's economy. We humans are at a choice point for survival. Planet Earth's ecosystem is spinning out of balance because humans are continuing to act out an economic story that no longer serves the greater good. Continuing on that path is the willful destruction of the natural environment. Many organizations are working to protect the water and the wildlife and to co-create the new story of thriving and resilient communities living in balance with all life forms. Thank you for your attention and for being a part of the solution. All right, thank you so much to Keith and Carolyn. That was a ton of information. So I'm sure we have lots of questions. I just wanted to mention a couple last things. So, um, you know, we just heard a lot of important information from Carolyn. And I think it's important for all of us to translate into, you know, what can we do to, you know, help preserve this area, especially because we all very much care about birds on this presentation. Um, and a lot of us are regularly visiting this area, be it, it to go to the Patent Center or bird the surrounding areas. So um, in the town of Patagonia, especially, there are many environmental nonprofits, including Tucson Audubon, the Nature Conservancy, Borderlands Restoration, and others that are all trying to work together to put together a conservation plan for this area. It's also important for every birder, uh, environment, nature appreciator who, you know, regularly visits this area and does contribute to something that we call the nature-based economy to make sure that their voices are heard as well. Now, special caveat for these times, as we are in the middle of a COVID crisis, um, we are not actively encouraging anyone to make that voice known particularly loud in town right now. <laughs> uh, we're trying to be responsible. Um, but come the time when we can travel safely again, you know, just noting that when you're in town, um, you know, making it known why you're there, mentioning it to your friends, um, stopping into town, having a slice of pie, um, making it very clear that, that uh, birders and nature appreciators have a role to play uh, in the future of Patagonia. And so when it comes uh, time to you know, submit comments to the state on mining proposals or other kinds of actions like that, we're ready to go and we know that our voice is strong and unified and we're ready to take action on the behalf of birds and wildlife for that area. So I will stop talking and I would love to hear any questions that we have and open it up for discussion at this point. One of the questions that came up a few times and I think it was answered in the chat by just, it would be good to have clarification. What are, what are the minerals that they're mining for in the Patagonia Mountains? The primary ones that they are looking for are manganese, silver, um, and lead. And also there is some copper that Barksdale is looking at, um, which is right next to the, the South 32 project. So those are the primary minerals. And then one of the other questions was, where did they get all the water? And um, I think Valerie mentioned that they get it from the groundwater. Is is that is that true? And wh yeah, where would they get all the water that they need to, to do the mining? The intention is to pump groundwater. And unfortunately, when the state uh, grants permission to pump all this groundwater, the state of Arizona does not take cumulative impacts, including drought and climate crisis, into consideration. Yeah, that's also that, that, another that, byproduct of really old, outdated mining laws um, and something that we continue to monitor um, and explore options for future action against that as well. I think that goes along with a question that um, Scott had of, uh, does the state of Arizona regulate mining on private land? 
there really are no regulations of mining on private lands. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the county has a specific state statute that does not allow it to make any laws with respect to mining operations on more than five acres. Um, and so it, it's, as I, you know, the mining industry identifies it as the ninth friendliest mining jurisdiction in the world because there are no regulations that have any meaning. It's a bend over backwards, help the mining company be as profitable as possible. Chitra was wondering, are there, what other environmental groups uh, are working with or helping PARA? Well, we're fortunate in this community to have a lot of organizations that are each doing proactive things. PARA is the organization that is the watchdog on the ground here locally to see what is happening with mining companies. We work with many of our local partners such as Tucson Audubon, Nature Conservancy, Borderlands, uh, and other organizations. PARA also works with primarily two national organizations, one being Earthworks, particularly with respect to water issues, and also with Defenders of Wildlife with respect to wildlife issues. Uh, as I said, we're, we're the eyes on the ground and as watchdogs, we bark loudly when something is going on. And the big dogs at those two organizations are uh, great resources for advice and also for legal help. Uh, there's a lot of different questions coming in. I'm trying to parse through all of them. Uh, one question that I thought was good, generally, how do locals view the mining? Well, it has changed over the course of time, and it depends upon the pressure being brought by whatever mining company is in the area. Back in 2006 until 2018, so for 12 years, there was a junior Canadian mining company in here under several names, most recently Arizona Mining. That company, by the way, for those of you in Tucson familiar with the Rosemont Project, the operations down in Patagonia were started by the same person who was Augusta Resources and sold off to HUD Bay. That's Richard Wark. When Richard Wark was in final negotiations to sell off the Rosemont project to HUD Bay, he sent his people down here and began filing claims in the Patagonia mountains. So for about a dozen years, this was a junior Canadian mining company. They don't ever mine a project. They develop projects to sell off to a seniors. Their tactics are different from the seniors and they, those tactics ended up creating divisiveness in the community. I always felt that the best gauge of where the community stands was our town election two years ago when uh, the mayor's position was up for election and the one candidate was for protecting the water and the wildlife. Never took a position of pro or anti-mining, but spoke as a, essentially a seven generation thinker who wants to protect the water and the wildlife. The other candidate was go mining, let's have at it because it's the greatest thing since sliced bread for our community. The let's protect the environment candidate won by a two to one margin in the largest turnout this community has ever had. I think that's the best indication of where the community is. Since the sale to the senior mining company, South 32, um, that background stirring up people has changed significantly. And also as more people are aware of the risks and the realities of mining, uh, more and more people are going, this isn't really going to be such a good thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see. Nicole, are you looking at the chat too? Yeah, I am. We didn't miss any from much earlier, did we? I want to make sure we don't leave people behind. No. Okay. no. Okay, I'll scroll all the way to the bottom then. You might have a better idea of which, which questions to, to go with. You have a much better understanding than I do of, of, of okay, the situation. Let's read through these. 
Um, and if Carolyn's okay with it, we can also share all of our contact information and you're welcome to email us later if you think of other questions as well. Um, a couple things about figuring out, you know, what state legislatures and decision makers we can target. Um, you know, there are regular environmental report cards that get put out. I don't know of one, maybe you do, Carolyn, that specifically looks at mining as like a political indicator. Um, I've generally seen it as more general category, um, but something we should look into. Questions in here? Yeah, I think that's what you're saying is correct, Nicole. There really isn't an overall, especially specific to the state of Arizona. Um, in, in our county here in Santa Cruz County, we do send questions to all the candidates for their responses, and then we share that via our newsletter. Um, but that's not, you know, it statewide only as it affects Santa Cruz County at this point. Yeah, so um, we're having a couple questions about water quality, and I wonder if Carolyn, you wanna talk a little bit about the concerns we have both about, both about water quality and water quantity, um, and why we're monitoring both of those. Well, yeah, they are both obviously very important. This groundwater uh, dewatering that they want to do, drawing out 1.6 billion gallons of water a year for four years, and then unknown yet what they would draw down after that uh, if, they, if they get approvals to move into uh, production is of major concern. PARA is a part of the town's flood and flow committee, which is in the process of sending a letter to the Forest Service asking for comprehensive surface and groundwater study of this entire region that our preferences it be conducted by USGS and paid for by the mining company and that no additional activities be allowed until that study is complete. Um, Nicole mentioned the conservation plan which has been crafted by the Nature Conservancy in partnership with Tucson Audubon and Borderlands Restoration and Circle Z. Um, as I said at the beginning, given the chaos of the times, there's no other place. And we have an incredible number of people here who are proactively working to protect the water quantity and quality. All right, I know we're coming up on our hour here, Luke. Um, do we want to see if anyone wants to raise their hand and ask a question? And maybe if people still yeah. have their questions, I'd welcome you guys to email us for sure. We'd go like another five minutes. Anyone have any any questions that you'd like to raise your hand for? And so to raise your hand, right next to the chat button, there's a little participant icon. You can click on that. We'll bring up everyone in the in the call with us and then Underneath that, it'll say invite or unmute me or raise hand, and you can just click raise hand. All right, so Nancy has a question. So Nancy, I'm, I'm gonna unmute you and you can ask your question. Well, when we hiked in and birded in Hersaw Creek, there was a lot of private property. And uh, is that on forest service land or <laughs> how did, <laughs> Aren't they upset about mining? I I don't get it. <laughs> so are you talking about the Forest Service or maybe people's properties along the road? People's properties along the road. I guess Keith or Carolyn, you want to talk about residents along Horshaw Road? Well, my experience with the residents along, Har well, there's Harshaw Creek Road and Harshaw Road. So Harshaw Creek Road, which we traveled today looking at the birds, uh, the private property owners that are along there are generally not at all pleased with the proposed mining activity, especially at one point when the mining company and the county were going to turn that into a four lane high highway while they uh, fixed a bridge and oh. get out there and drive Harshaw Creek Road. And you know, that wouldn't work. Um, and, and a large number of people showed up at the council meeting where that was being discussed and it went away. So stand up, speak out. It really does make a difference. Hmm. All right. Oh, 
put more questions on here. So. Yeah, let's take uh, two more questions. How's that? Yeah, that sounds good. Let's um, go with Ruth. Yep. Well. Sorry. I'm wondering if the mining companies will play the jobs card. Uh, have they talked about how many jobs will be generated by the mines and especially in this climate of pandemic? Oh, that's absolutely always what they talk about. And that is what their, their advertising is all about is jobs and economy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we are looking forward to is sharing all the economic information about nature-based economy as the healthier model for us and uh, you know if if you have you know please check out our website sign up for the newsletter there would be constant updates on what is going on out here okay all right thanks everyone it looks like we've highlighted important last question is how can everyone help now and the biggest thing i would say coming up is our national election <laughs> Now, we, of course, don't endorse candidates, um, but there will be a lot of excellent report cards coming out now that our primaries are over. Um, the Tucson paper puts out great, great um, informational report cards as well as interviews with candidates, and I'm sure there'll be several rounds of spirited debates. Um, so we'll be doing um, more action alerts as we get closer to the election. Um, but I think we had about a 30% turnout for the primaries. So let's keep that energy going all the way through the national elections. Um, and of course, even if you're not in Tucson, still important to vote. So thanks so much, everyone. Um, and if you're not signed up yet for our Tucson Audubon action alerts, that is how I communicate with everyone. So that is where all that information will be going out. All right, anything else, Luke? No, I just want to say that it, it's good that there are so many questions. You know, it's a it's an important thing for us to be thinking critically about this and to see things uh, from a big perspective and to be, um, yeah, to just be mindful of it. So what I would say is that throughout this year, uh, Nicole and I are working on creating more of these uh, virtual events that are going to focus on conservation issues and uh, looking at things from different angles and how we can be a part of uh, the solution. And so be looking for those. Um, we'll be sending out a few links and a recap email later today. And thank you so much for being part of the Southeast Arizona Birding Festival. It's just been amazing to see uh, everyone involved. I wanted to give a special thanks to Nicole and Carolyn and Keith for um, giving this presentation. It's, love these uh, virtual birding tours. It's been a really good way of, of doing it. So thanks, Nicole, for, for really spearheading that. And we've had a, a lot of different people help out in different ways throughout uh, this this week. Um, so yeah, th thank you all for being part of it. And uh, hope to see you at, at a virtual event down the road. Uh, we do have those. And like I said, I'll put that link in the uh, email we send out later. And a big thanks and cheers to Luke because yeah. he also needs a big round of applause. So thanks, thanks Luke. Mom. Absolutely. Amazing job. Thank you. <laughs> well, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmute everyone here real soon. And I can't believe it's the last, this is the last <laughs> event for the festival. Summer. Yeah, you guys we can keep okay. going. Good job. 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 Good job.